All right. All right. Hello, folks. Good to see you again. Uh, today, we're going to continue our discussions about AI. Uh, for those of you who've been kind of following the AI world, you know that the big news today is AlphaGo Zero. So before we go any further, do you know what AlphaGo is? Well, AlphaGo is this game from, it's this bot from DeepMind that uses very sophisticated deep learning, among other techniques, originally, mm -hmm. to solve the game of Go, which is generally accepted to be the, the hardest game, really, a computer could play. Um, the possible game states that well exceeds the number of atoms in the universe, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's really what makes it hard. Um, just, you know, we thought that was hard, but by comparison, Go is really actually hard. Go does, so the thing is, unlike chess, which has an 8x8 board, Go has a 19x19 board. So there's more moves you can make. Um, there's just kind of longer games. There's complicated patterns. It's much harder to tell when uh, there's two sides, black and white, just like in chess. But unlike chess, there are no separate pieces. It's just stones and patterns on, uh, on the board. So in general, like, Ghost has been hard for computers. Like, I believe... Until very recently, the best computer Go systems were basically amateur level. A good mm -hmm. amateur could beat them. But that really changed with the advent of AlphaGo, which I think beat a number of the world champions. It, it did, but not without quite a lot of effort. I think mm -hmm. it was running on... Were they running the original one on TPUs? Yeah, yeah. So I think so. They were running them on TPUs. Probably a few dozen TPUs, probably you know, 100 cores, something like that. They put in a bunch of computer power. So the story mm -hmm. goes that essentially Google made this first deep learning system called AlphaGo. And AlphaGo used a deep convolutional network, I believe, or I've just been a deep fully connected. I would need to check that to featureize mm -hmm. the uh, Go board state. And then they used this large data set of master Go games where, I don't know, so professional Go players are measured in DOM. Uh, so I think like nine DOM is like, close to a grandmaster. So mm -hmm. I think they used a bunch of board games from 6 dawn and up. And they used this to pre-train the uh, network so that it started mm -hmm. with a pretty good guess of how a master Go player would have acted. Mm -hmm. And then from there, they kind of worked their way up. And they trained it with some self-play against itself to get even better. And that got it up to the point where I think it could be the Go champion. OK. So the original one was still doing self-playing. It was doing self-playing, okay. but the key trick was it bootstrapped from the master game. So mm -hmm. it started from a pretty good point where it was like, mm -hmm. I think even without self-play, it was actually like a strong, amateur, mediocre, beginner pro type mm -hmm. uh, level. And then with self-play, it got from, you know, beginning pro up to like grandmaster level, which was a giant achievement. Yeah. Now, do you, do you remember some of the uh, impact of the original AlphaGo victory? Well, I think they got the cover of Nature to start, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. That's a big one. I think a big part of the work they do is bring more intent, um, attention to the AI space, and this is something that they can seriously. If you have been talking about AI for 20, 30 years, and you know, for the people who aren't in the industry, you're a little bit skeptical. Yep. But when you see something like Go fall, mm -hmm. that's pretty significant. So actually, if you guys haven't watched this already, we really recommend checking out the Lisa Doll versus AlphaGo battle. Mm -hmm. like, there, in fact, I think there was this like award-winning documentary that just yeah, came there's, out a little, there's a indie movie on it now. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, I need to check that out. But it was like compelling watching because you mm -hmm. see this go master Lisa Ball, who's like uh, this very composed. Like mm -hmm. you can tell he it's like the Roger Federer of Go, essentially. Like a mm -hmm. uh, guy who's in his prime as a go master, and he's trying so hard, and the machine is still beating him. It wasn't. It wasn't dominant. I think it was a four to one. Then Lisa all did mm -hmm. break through, and I think actually for the one game you won, there was like cheering in the streets. Really? Yeah, outside. <laughs> They're like one victory in history for humanity. Yeah, the, the game is, is really actually quite a big deal in Asia. I think mm -hmm. you probably don't hear about it much in the U.S., but this is serious stuff out there. And actually, I think there's talk that the victory over Lisa all like catalyzed the uh, Chinese government to make their giant push into AI. So mm -hmm. it's not just. Um, is I think if you invert the situation, imagine that um, know, Chinese companies came in and in 1970 had beaten America's best uh, chess grandmaster. Yeah. You can see why this is like a Sputnik moment almost. Mm -hmm. So it's had a giant effect on global geopolitics and AI already. Mm -hmm. And then I think this happened around March, this whole thing, right? Wasn't that, that soon? Like, yeah, it wasn't that long ago, I think. It was definitely this year, right? 
you know, I would have to Google that, but it, it is recent. It yeah, is recent. and then I think they've done probably three or four iterations since then. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And now it's, you know, the barred entry has gone down significantly. I think they had a version called, um, so the first version which came out sometime last year, mm -hmm. uh, they called it AlphaGo Fan, so it beat, I think, mm -hmm. Fan Hui, who's the European Go master, but is not a, I don't believe he's a grandmaster. Mm -hmm. And this came out last year. Then there's AlphaGo Lease It All, the version that won against Lease It All. And then they had a version called AlphaGo Master that uh, they put out a few months ago. I think it beat like 60 all at once or something like that, right? Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. So it turned out it turns out that many Go uh, grandmasters actually play Internet Go, and it beat, mm -hmm. I think, 60 grandmasters. So it it, it makes you think about what the scale of intelligence is, right? You go from being, you know, amateur to, to being pro mm -hmm. and to beating every professional on earth all at the same time in like a year or two. Well, there are caveats, right? Because yeah. like in Go, the rules are set. Mm -hmm. There's no uncertainty. There's only so many moves you can make. Mm -hmm. And like in real life, like we don't know what the rules are to success. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know what the moves are. Like there's so much uncertainty. Uh, but it's so, you're right. It does make you think. Yeah. So the question then is, now we have this new version of, called AlphaGo Zero that just came out today. It's another, was it cover of nature or just a nature paper? I think it was just a nature paper. Oh, just a nature paper. Just a nature paper. Yeah. <laughs> um, but this one, I think, was in some ways an even more profound technical achievement than mm -hmm. many of the previous versions, I think, because it removed a number of limitations in the original AlphaGo system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, I think, the real kind of, the most important tidbit of this whole thing is that it can learn by just playing against itself. You have uh, this network that can spit out uh, a, a vector of possible moves, essentially, right? And then you can explore behind those moves. We read about half the paper, so struggling here a little bit. And then it puts out a, a game state estimate of I think, who will end up winning the game, right? Some, some score there, right? So you have a possible list of actions, and then you have a measure of how long you're doing. Yep. And I think the real improvement of AlphaGo Zero over mm -hmm. the previous AlphaGo versions was that they didn't bootstrap by playing with the master level games. Mm -hmm. They started with random networks that were just like, oh, hey, here's a random Go player. And mm -hmm. it played against itself. And it just iteratively did this over and over again to the point where I think in three days of training, it surpassed the AlphaGo we set all version. Yeah. So it gives you a scale of the improvement and how, how much better it um, Supposedly, what really helps is that the uh, the AI that you're competing against during the training process is always basically slightly better than you are. What, what, the, what you do in training is that you take the network that is like over some threshold of performance and basically the best you've had so far, mm -hmm. and then you compete against that one until you beat it by a certain margin, and then that becomes what you play against. So you have this perfect notion of, of difficulty at every point in time. Mm -hmm. You know, if you you can imagine that if you have the uh, the amateur. Go AI, go against the best one. They probably would never win enough to know what winning is like yep. and kind of see all those states. So you have, you have something this, that's a slightly better than you. Yeah. And you just iteratively keep beating a slightly mm -hmm. harder opponent. Yeah. I can see that. And your opponent just keeps getting slightly harder. Ah, and then so they have this beautiful chart where they show that kind of the performance of AlphaGo, right? AlphaGo, the various AlphaGo is measured on mm -hmm. the ELO scale. So the ELO scale is commonly used in competitive games is a measurement of uh, uh, performance. And I think the idea is that if you are 200 EVO points above someone else, mm -hmm. there's a 75% chance you'll beat them in a head-on matchup. Mm -hmm. So I think, I, I'm forgetting the precise numbers, but like uh, AlphaGo Lee said all was roughly at the best human champion. AlphaGo Master, I think, went up another 500 EVO points mm -hmm. over AlphaGo Lee all. And this one climbed up yet another 500 points. Really? So this is wow. like far off into the ether of no human has ever played Go as well. Yeah, I think also an important aspect as well is that I think the train was actually, if I remember correctly, the training was done on like 50 GPUs or something like that. It wasn't yeah. on the TPU. So, you know, if you're patient enough, you maybe scale the networks down a little bit. This is something that you could conceivably actually build yourself. So, you say they yeah. have the training on Google Cloud, in fact. Mm -hmm. So, while my guess is you'd burn a lot of money doing the Google Cloud yeah. training, it is not inconceivable that. You could write some open source code even and make a little project mm -hmm. and get some master level code there out and deploy. Yeah, I wonder when we're actually going to see this open source because I think there were some pretty big gaps in, in how this works. I think basically they described the pair reinforcement learning as mm -hmm. kind of this new method. Yep. It yep. kind of ended there. 
So it probably will take time until we see the implementation. So one thing we, we do need to call deep mind out on is they're not good about open source and code. I don't think I've ever seen them open source. Has deep mind, they've open source one thing, which is a Python StarCraft API layer, but I've not seen anything else open source out of it. Yeah, I think they open sourced the original DQM paper. Did they? Okay. Um, back when they are using Torch for that. Mm -hmm. um, I think they released also a, a TensorFlow wrapper. Solid, I think. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. sounds like a really good idea. If you probably want to be using DeepMind's wrapper, right? Um, but I don't think that really ever going anywhere. I think it, it's so. something caught on with the community. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Whereas, like, OpenAI, you look at them, they open source mm -hmm. everything. You have to give them mm -hmm. props for that. Like, they make a paper, code's out on the internet probably the next day. And that, that's a big that's a big improvement. And I think DeepMind, especially if they are building systems of this power and complexity, mm -hmm. I think they have a bit of a... I don't know if I go, maybe yeah, I'll call it a duty to open source a code and put it out there, especially if they're building things that could potentially be dangerous. Yeah, I think if you're not open sourcing the code, uh, you probably have to complete an explanation for that. Yeah. Uh, why, are you, why are you keeping this to yourself? Yes, what do you expect to be able to do with it? Mm -hmm. So one question is how far can AlphaGo Zero do? Like last time we had one of these video chats, we talked about mm -hmm. AGI. So the question is then, before AlphaGo Zero, how far away would you said HGI or artificial general intelligence uh, was from happening? And after AlphaGo Zero, how far up would you say it is? Um, so I, I think I said HGI was probably like 20, 25 years out or something like that. Mm -hmm. I'd say probably not five years off that. And this is something that definitely looks innately intelligent, doesn't it? It does. It starts. So they do have a very nice discussion in the paper about what is still hard coded. And mm -hmm. I think what's hard coded is the fact that the game board is 19 by 19 mm -hmm. and the rules of Go. But that's it. So basically, you have a system that starts with the knowledge Go, Go, Go games are played on a 19 by 19 uh, board mm -hmm. and have these rules and go to town. And they've picked up uh, super grandmaster level play from just there. Yeah, it makes you wonder what the other applications of this are. Uh, Go is as hard as most environments I can imagine get. So what do you think about, say, in the drug discovery industry? Do you think there's going to be a big application? Um, it's possible. It's possible. So in drug discovery, your, your actions and your, your state are basically molecules. Your actions are you know, in chemical synthesis, right? And you can move from molecule to molecule. Um, the problem with doing any chemical synthesis, no matter how well informed you are, is that it's expensive. Mm -hmm. That's a good point, right? In the real world, you can't simulate everything. Just mm -hmm. like you can in Go Engine, whereas you can't simulate doing the chemical synthesis because that's we don't understand the physics of the chemistry. Yeah, it's well, tough. It's expensive. Um, if you go to a chemist with some crazy molecule and you say, "Please synthesize this for me," <laughs> you're um, gonna laugh you out of that room. Yeah, it's, it's not going to happen. So I, I haven't seen reinforcement learning really work in that domain yet. There have been a couple of attempts. I think I've seen a couple papers with people. Trying, but oh, the alpha chem thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't. I think it's much more immature <laughs> than uh, alpha chem. Mm -hmm. So actually, maybe this is coming to a central point, right? If you have a system that you can't wrap up in a simulator or a game world, mm -hmm. all these reinforcement learning techniques are not going to work for you. Is yeah. That right. Yeah. So the question is then, what is really the impact of alpha go zero? So I think the reason why it's such a big advance is it took away the need for pre-training on master level games. Mm -hmm. And it took away, we didn't mention this too much in detail earlier, but the need for human um, pre-featurization of the game board, as in like pre-encoding mm -hmm. things that are important about code games. So they took those two important pieces out, and it's now learning that from scratch. But mm -hmm. there is still this game world limitation. What are some other limitations, you think? Um, of AlphaGo Zero in particular. Or the technology well, to analyze. It has to be a game where you can conceivably you're competing against someone, right? Mm. So So maybe an open world are there any good open world games where there's no there's no victory state? Um an open world game where there's no victory state. Are there such I'm not a big gamer, so I don't actually know. Yeah, hard to say. I would imagine though that Star like Starcraft one is on the very near horizon. Do you really think, how far out do you think a StarCraft one is? I mean, after this, I would assume less than a year. Oh, wow. So the thing with StarCraft is you have like way more games per, uh, moves per game. So mm -hmm. you have a bunch of micro moves per 
So StarCraft is a real-time strategy game. You have mm -hmm. three races, humans, Zerg, and Protoss, which are two different types of aliens. Mm -hmm. uh, you have basically, it's a war game. So you get resources, you build unit barracks and the like. These make soldiers, you control the soldiers, and you try to destroy your enemy base. And the issues are often hundreds of soldiers on mm -hmm. your side. So there might be thousands or tens of thousands of micro or where you're like, soldier 92, move over there and attack mm -hmm. um, enemy 43. There's, so the games are just so many more moves. Yeah, it's, it's probably like Go, except the board is almost smooth. Yeah, so way yeah. better board. Um, Do you really think it's that close? It's still a formidable challenge. They haven't demonstrated that type of scaling yet. I, well, I think it depends on whether or not you have access to the underlying game state. So I, I think OpenAI, when they did the, the, the experiments, that was they had access to the underlying game state. So are we talking about Dota 2, or did they have, did they have a Star Wars? Oh, that was Dota 2, I think, right? Yeah, I think that's, that's pretty close, though, Dota right? Dota 2 is a shooter game, though, right? They did one-on-one -on -one Dota 2. Is Dota 2 a shooter game? I don't actually play Dota 2, so I might be making this up. You tell me. I, I think it's kind of like StarCraft, but I, I, could be, I could be wrong. I think it's like, it's, it is a fighting game, but mm -hmm. it's... They did one-on-one, -on -one, so they had like one player fight another player. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas like StarCraft is like mass squadrons and like it's more like a tactics strategy game. So it's like you have like flanking uh, movements and you have like a yeah, so it's it's like command and conquer, right? I think um, so. I think so. Yeah, I well, so I, I think either way, if you back into the game state, that kind of changes the problem. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have access to the online game state, you know, do you have access to the enemies? Um, as well, mm -hmm. that's tough because when you're actually playing StarCraft, you have this fog of war. You don't actually yeah. get to see what your enemies are doing until you observe that part of the, the game world. Exactly. So I think, in some sense, maybe poker. There have been there was uh, yeah. there's mm -hmm. like a University of Alberta, I'd like to say, um, paper where they showed uh, Texas Hold'em uh, Unlimited Unlimited was they have a grandmaster level play. This is all reinforcing mm -hmm. learning though. Yeah, I, I have heard of that. I, I still don't understand actually why that's so hard. You think like you think this would be pretty easy to, to figure I out. Think it's right? uncertainty, right? Because you don't you don't know what's in your opponent's hand. It's like the separate problem with book. Can you simulate it and just keep playing these games for reinforcement learning now? My guess is that I would so I would love to see a reinforcement learned poker player. I think mm -hmm. it it's not undoable, but it's not about yet, I think. Yeah, I think I don't really know how to play poker, but I assume that if you have knowledge of what cards you have, you might be able to, and then help you know, aggress what everyone else is playing. <laughs> you condition all that information, you might be able to infer something about like um, what other people uh, might have. Could you learn that without any training except beyond the hand, the rules of poker? Now that would be impressive. If you could learn to do that type of, you know, counterfactual mm -hmm. reasoning about what your opponent is doing. That would be, I think, a major breakthrough. Like it's half poker I think is halfway between where well, it's a smaller game world than mm -hmm. Go, but it's like more uncertain. StarCraft is a bigger game world that's more uncertain. Yeah. Um, so StarCraft seems like hard on two dimensions, both bigger and more uncertain. Yeah. But I think StarCraft is less uncertain than poker. Because like the fog of war is, you can kind of guess what's in kind of, it's not as hard as guessing what's in your opponent's poker hand, you know? Yeah, I think so. It's tricky, it's tricky. I. At the same time, I think you know, it's poker seems pretty easy to simulate. Yeah, I, I assume mm -hmm. that's like a couple hundred lines of code to simulate at poker, right? Probably. Right. So you know, you can kind of get an agent to play another get against another agent, and eventually, you think that they're pretty good at it. Oh yeah, I so, guess so. I guess they would. I, I think you're right. Yeah, I mean, I, I I would agree that there probably is a lot of uncertainty, so there probably isn't much signal. However. Um, as long as you get some sort of signal, you probably win. You know, if, if they'd open source your mm -hmm. code, you could have just run this experiment. Of course, code. right? But well, unless, unless, unless it was written in TensorFlow, which in case, no, no, don't no. bother. <laughs> um, so, for people not in the know, there's a there's already language wars in the deep learning community. Is it TensorFlow? Mm -hmm. Is it PyTorch? Is it MXNet? Is it I don't even know what the infinite layers are. So it's just like programming languages all over again. Well, Emacs. Well, let's, let's talk about that actually. TensorFlow or PyTorch? Which way? This is a good question. So mm -hmm. for DeepCam, so DeepCam is the open source community I run, um, mm -hmm. we are still using TensorFlow. It's more stable, has better engineering. Um, I think it's still the better option if you want to write like solid code. Mm -hmm. PyTorch is catching up though. What do you think? 
Um, I think what I've learned in, in, in that I've gotten pretty in far in depth with both. PyTorch is definitely more beginner friendly. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about all this graph construction. Um, the graph is kind of implicit, mm -hmm. um, and the autograd does a pretty good job of knowing what it's supposed to actually yeah. propagate through. Um, the problem, I guess, with PyTorch is that if you want to do some even more fancy stuff, the uh, the graph that isn't there but really is, you have to actually know how that works. Oh, I see. You know what I mean? The, uh, yeah, all the stuff that's attracted away, and you're like, oh, well, PyTorch is really easy. You don't have to worry about all that stuff. It's all dynamic. Well, now you actually have to understand what I you're see, doing. So you're writing implementations of what you can do dynamically. So it makes um, the easy case much easier, but the hard case yeah. might potentially be even harder. Oh, like if you want to implement an LCM, I assume that's like trivial yeah. in PyTorch, right? Whereas in TensorFlow, that could actually be reasonably tricky. It is yeah. fairly tricky to get an LCM, right? So yeah. maybe TensorFlow is like, there's a bigger initial bump, but once you're past mm -hmm. that bump, it's relatively easy scaling, whereas in PyTorch, it's much more gradual. But yeah. eventually, it does get more painful than TensorFlow for the really hard things. Yeah, it, it, it does. It does. And TensorFlow is still ahead in terms of support. Mm -hmm. Like, PyTorch only had second derivatives like a month ago. Mm -hmm. That's and, a good point. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you want to look at things related to that, like, there's probably like three or four people that have like done stuff related to second derivatives in PyTorch. Whereas I think there's been multiple versions of multi-derivative support. Yeah. It's much more polished. Mm -hmm. I assume it's because Google is building stuff on top of it. And it has like what seventy-five thousand GitHub stars. Yeah. So another like mm -hmm. little point. So in the open source world, the number of stars you have on GitHub is a good proxy for the mm -hmm. influence of your project. I think TensorFlow is like king of GitHub at this point. Like it. Yeah. Is either the most popular or pretty darn close to it? Yeah, it's probably like, on there. Like React, TensorFlow. And I would imagine so. something like that. Yeah. So, like for a bit of context, I think Kim has like almost five fifty stars. Okay. Yeah. Whereas TensorFlow seventy five thousand. So that gives you a yeah. scale of the developer communities, right? Highport yeah. is like seven thousand. So okay, it's like a tenth of TensorFlow, but maybe a little more than ten times what Kim is. That said, I think you look in the research community; it's probably fifty fifty now. I would think, right? I think. There is a big shift in the research mm -hmm. community towards Python, sure. Yeah. But in the engineering community, in the uh, application of machine learning community, I think I do see a few determined PyTorch users, mm -hmm. but I think TensorFlow is dominating over there. Is they have mobile, yeah. they have deployment, production. Yeah, I think so too. Um, well, with PyTorch, you can export your models to Cafe 2 mm -hmm. and Cafe 2 run on mobile. However, you know, that's there, gonna be a pain, I imagine. Oh, I mean, if you try that, you're probably one of a few dozen people that have ever looked at that code before. Whereas you how know? many people have deployed TensorFlow? Probably a few thousand at this point. Oh, probably, yeah. There's probably tons of companies that do it. I think um, so. I think so. Although, although I still have not gotten TensorFlow served to work. <laughs> uh, what, what's TensorFlow serving about? Can you talk a bit about that? Sure, yeah. TensorFlow serving is TensorFlow's method of deploying models, making it really easy. Um, well, supposedly. But you end up actually having to like, build TensorFlow serve. And it's like specific to your machine, you need to like export your graph. And I think you end up doing like a lot of stuff in that C. Oh god. And then you bring the server live, and it's like a heavy duty server, it's like multi-threaded, and like you know, it's like a Google scale kind of like product. Um, so getting that live is pretty hard. Whereas mm -hmm. with MyTorch, you can, you know, you wrap it in like a flask. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, you wrap it in flask, you know, will it scale to millions? Probably not, but you know. The way I think about Google code is that they try to build skyscrapers for everything. Yeah. So they have like you know the steel rebars and like the ultra heavy duty support, but sometimes mm -hmm. you're just like, hey, I want to build like a little like garden shed, and they're like, great, we'll put a skyscraper in with that cement foundation, put it yeah. for you, and we're like, but this is a ten foot tall garden. I don't need any of this. And yeah. that's a trade off, right? That's what you get with Google Code. I think can it's amazingly good at what it does. I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure AlphaGo Zero is it is trained on Google Cloud on TPUs, TensorFlow processing units, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's all TensorFlow all the way down. So no. the pinnacle of. I would love to know how short the uh, Tensor the uh, the AlphaGo uh, Zero code is. So there's a great anecdote about that. I think someone, maybe Peter mm -hmm. Norwick, had a slide that um, Google's previous translation system is like five hundred thousand lines of code. Sounds about right. Whereas the core new Google neural machine translates like five hundred yeah. lines of code. In fact, I think that code's open source. Google, in general, mm -hmm. outside DeepMind, is pretty darn good about open source. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing what you can do with less than a thousand lines of Python. Um, yeah, Google's like core translation product, less than a thousand lines probably. 
And so. for those of you who haven't tried, you should go and try the new Google Neural Machine Translate. That's some good stuff. Like yeah. it does, it does make mini translations much more smooth and just more mm -hmm. believable than they used to be. Is that the one where they take in kind of n languages at the bottom and n languages at the top and they train it all at once? Exactly. So one? it's this um, basically transfer learn sequence to sequence mm -hmm. deep model. Um, which, by the way, so one of the, our papers, we used that to do chemical retrosynthesis, tying okay. back all the threads of the conversation. Yeah. So it's a very general, very useful technology. And the core library is open sourced. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, amazing what you can do less than 1,000 lines. I, you know, the, the original AlphaGo, I keep thinking that's probably many tens of thousands of lines. They probably had a whole like, data center set up or something like that live. Um, so actually, here's a question for you. When, how long do you think it's going to be before you have a meta-learned uh, alpha goes zero. So that is, say, a system that learns how to learn the, the game of Go. Do you think that's even possible? Where are the tasks? Maybe the task would be that you get oodles of board games. You got your chess, oh, okay. you got your whatever, and the task is you need to learn a new board game that might have different rules, but you might have never seen before. You know, probably, probably not that long. Mm. Um, that'd be my guess. The manual seems to have a lot of applications in reinforcement learning. If you, if you read that paper, so for those of you who don't know, MAML is um, model agnostic, I surely know this, meta learning. Yes. Yeah, model agnostic meta learning. And it's basically a grade descent on a grade descent. So in addition to learning whatever task you, you want to learn, there's a layer above that that learns to learn really quickly on whatever new data set you decide to give it. So, you know, if you wanted to do I don't know, like a trans. Yeah, if you want to do like a board playing game, right? You train mm -hmm. it on Monopoly, you train it on chess, you train it on checkers, and then you give it, you know, snakes and ladders. Mm -hmm. And it already knows kind of how to see because it's not the first game board's ever seen. It knows the pieces that you can move. It probably knows certain patterns are interesting. It kind of knows how to map up the scores. This one's kind of all wired up, and it resembles kind of how humans work. If you if I Play some random board game with a rock right now. It's not the first board game I've ever played, right? So we'd yeah, pick it up. Well, you'd probably pick it up in like a half an hour, right? And, and if we swap the color scheme on the board game, yeah, yeah. I think like if black became white and white became black mm -hmm. in chess, and actually that doesn't even matter. Let's <laughs> say black became green. Yeah. I don't think it would stop us for more than five seconds. Yeah, or you like you change the role of some of the pieces kind of yeah. just like randomly. Um, you would pick up on that pretty quickly. There's a couple like there's a there's some war cards. There's like chess mm -hmm. variants like. Like 3D chess. Oh yeah, I'm 3D chess. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that's something humans are still better at. So actually, mm -hmm. this gets back to alpha zero limitation. They hard code in the, the the board state and the rules. So oh, okay. That I think is one of the next things. Mm -hmm. So I think meta learning might be a path to remove that limitation, or maybe the setup is now. Here is um, some maybe just like a camera output mm -hmm. or some visual state from like a rendered system, and here is the listing of. Uh, pieces that are on your side of the table. Mm -hmm. And you can place pieces on the board, but you might get a signal back that that's an illegal move and you lose the game. Oh, okay. And you just play infinitely many games until, one, you learn the rules, mm -hmm. and then two, you learn how to actually play. Maybe that's the next level from. Yeah, that's so, actually very interesting you mentioned that. I, it seems doable as long as you, you know, as long as like 99, like five nines actions are, are, are not invalid. So mm. what I mean by that is that you know, if you because the system starts training randomly and if it, just, it, does, if it, it never makes a valid move, you probably are pretty screwed, right? So you end up kind of, you'll have to end up brute forcing that. You'll eventually have to get a move that works. You you think about that, right? Like I can't imagine that random is that good compared with the mastery mm -hmm. levels you can do. So mm -hmm. it's probably already pretty good at like starting from just nothing and getting to like a pretty narrow state. So. So I, would, I would love to run this test and just see if it could do it if it were open sourced. Yeah, if it was only if it was open source, Google. I'm looking at you, any Google employees. <laughs> go, uh, go talk to your management. But yeah. Anyways, but yeah, yeah, I, I think it might be able to learn that even if it's like an uncertain game state. Yeah, they could. In well, what's well, tricky then is that if you don't know all the possible actions that you can take when you don't know the length that vector coming out. Hmm. And right. So TensorFlow is notoriously bad at this. If you don't know yeah. the size of the input, it's a royal pain in the butt. So you actually mm -hmm. end up doing this thing called zero padding, mm -hmm. where you like say, 
every sentence I come in, I assume, will be less than 50 words. Yeah. But if I have a 13-word sentence, too bad. You have 37 zero words. Yeah. Suck at the end of that. It's it's dumb, but that's actually how Google Neural Machine Translate works underneath the hood. Probably not a problem for PyTorch. It, yes, this is something PyTorch. <laughs> that's actually you're the you're the PyTorch master. That, is it a problem for PyTorch? Um, probably not. Like you can, like the batch size you want to use at runtime, you could make that whatever you want. It's yeah. really cool. But that's actually like a, a not insignificant deal. So for those of you that don't know, the batch size is the the number of examples you use for update and training your network. So traditionally in statistics, you basically would use the entire data set, right? Yep. We, and yep. we, that's just recipe. that's just gradient descent. And now we use stochastic so gradient descent or, or batch stochastic gradient descent. You take like, you know, usually like 40 examples and you back propagate with respect to bat loss instead. Um, anyways, um, the bigger that batch is, the better you saturate the compute capacity of the GPU. So bigger batches are very desirable. So yeah, with PyTorch during inference, you can make the batch size a couple thousand. That's not really an issue. Oh yeah, yeah, that's nice. Yeah. Because yeah, you, know, you often have like a lot of like really dumb TensorFlow code that's like mm -hmm. you want to answer a thousand queries, but you need to chop them up in batches of fifty or whatever you yeah. use. Um, and I think they're working on a new system called TensorFlow. Eager, Eager, yes. yes. I've been looking at this very much because I think that mm -hmm. that's really the best of both worlds, right? Exactly. If, if you can. Um, it should basically be like PyTorch, I assume, right? Yeah, PyTorch with all the goodness and like mm -hmm. industrial strength, steel skyscraper, mm -hmm. um, Google strength, TensorFlow coming. Yeah, and I, I think they've actually worked on this for some time. I looked at the repo for Eager, and it's, it's about a year old, and they've been working on this for some time. So, so hopefully that's like a TensorFlow 2.0 feature where mm -hmm. you have the power of this like this horrible like rigidity of the batch size. Because yeah, imagine mm -hmm. board sizes, but boards of different sizes. Mm -hmm. And the way TensorFlow is set up now, it's not easy. I can't actually even making the system. So one one thing about Go is that there are actually Go subjects. So mm -hmm. kids might, I think, start on like three by three Go, and mm -hmm. work up to nine by nine. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And then actually, so uh, back in college, a friend tried tried really hard to teach me Go. Unfortunately, my poor brain was not smart enough to pick up Go, <laughs> and he gave up on me after a while. But yeah, with AlphaGo. It would be nice if it could learn to play n by n go. So, what if there's like levels of go mastery out in the forty-five by forty-five game boards where you have these like beautiful ripple patterns that actually match maybe real-world war conflicts or like mm -hmm. global scale patterns? That would be interesting. Yeah, it makes you wonder how far you could scale that up. Because if you master three by three, maybe you can move on to six by six. The pattern, the the space of patterns that you can create on the bigger board will be different. But not entirely different from three by three. And this is like the central notion of curriculum learning, right? Mm -hmm. So curriculum learning is the idea that just like kids start by learning easy things and work their way up, mm -hmm. you can start by doing easy tasks and working your way up. But in practice, some of these like game board sizing issues and TensorFlow mm -hmm. fixed input sizes and batch sizes like just make it painful enough that people haven't really got curriculum training to work out. Mm -hmm. Maybe that could change it either or if PyTorch works out their scaling issues and makes mm -hmm. the hard things not unreasonably hard. Yeah, so who's supporting PyTorch today? It's mostly Facebook, right? I think it's mainly Facebook mm -hmm. and a lot of the natural language processing research community. Oh, okay, yeah. But these guys aren't running like giant industrial scale things. They're more like trying weird mathematical loss functions or exotic things on small data sets. Mm -hmm. so. To step back for a second, yeah, yeah. what do you think is next for AI? Maybe like next next year. That's a good question. I think your Starcraft yeah. call isn't far off the mark. So mm -hmm. DeepMind seems to like optimize for Splash. So mm -hmm. they might have a pretty decent Starcraft agent already. But my guess is it's not good enough to be the halfway decent player. Yeah, it might take them a couple of years, but I think at this point they've earned enough credibility that management at Google will be like, "All right, guys, you need two years." Thing. They said they're going to do protein food too. Now that's a problem I thought a lot about. Yeah, so good luck, good luck. Um, so what we've seen before is, so me and Robert are really familiar with this industry, right? And what you find is that you have these you know, quite brilliant AI scientists, mm -hmm. you know, IT guys from Google, Facebook. They think, oh, you know, the problem with the, bio, the biological sciences in the pharmaceutical industry is like, oh man, if they only had Facebook's data center, in our software, they could do anything, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then they find out full protein folding is like the most NP-complete kind of thing on the mm -hmm. face of the earth. 
Um, and actually, so at some point, like uh, another member of kind of our research group and I tried doing mm -hmm. some LSTMs. We tried doing some like con nets. We good ideas. The protein folding is hard. Yeah, proteins are not convex. Think of them really like most of you might not have biological experience. So better way mm -hmm. to think about proteins is it's like a fifty-armed robot, and you're trying to control a fifty-armed robot and assemble it from scratch, mm -hmm. and it comes to you in like a building block pieces, and you're like, all right, how do I assemble this fifty-armed gigantic robot mm -hmm. and make it function from scratch? So it's like this assembly problem that's like. I'd say an order of magnitude harder than any of the robotic problems or even the Definitely. growing problems. Is winning yeah. one? It's so hard to even know when victory is. It's, it's extraordinarily difficult. You know, you have, you know, some of these proteins are like in the mega Dalton range. Daltons are atomic mass units, so hydrogen is, <laughs> is one Dalton, yeah. which means there are millions of atoms uh, Kind of floating around, it's and, and that products. and that protein is also not in a vacuum, by the way. So it's floating, mm -hmm. in, floating in water. So the waters um, can be very critical. These things mm -hmm. called water bridges that might stabilize the protein reactions. Yeah, and then you this comes, you know, out of what was it, a whole reactor apparatus. I should really know this um, as a long string, and the string kind of crumples up into a structure that is, is and that structure is very important for that. Or oh, in one protein. side note is that there are these things called chaperones that actually assemble many of the proteins. Oh wow! So Proteins often don't just like form themselves naturally. Some of them mm -hmm. are helped along by little other helper robots. So it's like robots making robots all the way down. Yeah, I, I think I think good luck. I think the the complexity that you see with proteins is just you know, it's it's just so there's so much evolution that it's kind of so far off and it, that you can't really understand what the solution state is because it's just you're miles away from it. You'll never get a hint of it. So there's this one game called Folded. Have you heard about this? I have. So like apparently humans are good at this, which is yeah. yeah, yeah. Are they actually? So like this is out of David Baker's group up at the University of Washington. Mm -hmm. They basically have like a little video game where they have like pre-assembled protein maker of mm -hmm. the and human players. I think they have successfully assembled many proteins. Really? So and yeah. LCMs can't. We didn't try anything as sophisticated as what David Baker's people had done. So okay. I think their group is um, spent a lot of time thinking about this. They put together mm -hmm. a very nice system. So if mm -hmm. I had to wager, I would guess that DeepMind is teaming up with the Folded people. And they're mm -hmm. using the video game interface. Uh -huh. And then training a reinforcement learner to win the Folded video game. I mean, that would probably be like Nobel Prize kind of stuff. It might be. I, I would be yeah. very surprised if, like, if this stuff does not win the Nobel Prize, it's like that mm -hmm. guy with the lithium ion battery, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, he deserves a Nobel Prize, but he's like 95 years old, he's yeah. sure. still yeah. has not won the Nobel Prize. This is like almost a running joke in the chemistry community. Really? Yeah, they just keep passing over for some reason. Mm -hmm. So if they do pass it over, it's going to be like that. This is this is worthy of a Nobel Prize at some point, mm -hmm. certainly. Whether or not the the uh, Nobel Committee decides that that might be a political thing. No. Can you get a Nobel Prize in computer science? I don't think so. You only get a Turing Award, but okay. you have won. There have been computational Nobels. Like mm -hmm. people have, um, this is a couple of years ago, for um, QMMM methods. So okay. these are a type of simulation method commonly used in simulating proteins, mm -hmm. by the way. So for some work on that done in the 1970s, I think there was a chemistry Nobel Award. Okay. So this could win potentially a chemistry Nobel one day. Oh, I think you're right. Mm -hmm. I think you're right. Yeah, if you make a significant impact on predicting how proteins fold. Then how proteins function. Yeah. That's that's one of the biggest problems in medicine, really. Is it really that big a problem? Like people like to say that, but in, in the industry oh. do you see that? Oh well, okay, yeah, this is uh you you've, you've hit a, a good spot. So yeah, st structure guided drug design. I, I think it's debatable how much value there is there. So is it one of these problems that like everyone says is a big problem and is really hard, but you know, this is actually because you need to get the fold. Like in these proteins move. There's you know mm. they, they they move in the water. They have like kind of arms and they have like things that can open and close. Like, these are these are very sophisticated machines. And you know I think David Shaw at Dean Shaw who built like a fifty million dollar A6 supercomputer just to simulate this. And I think he can get like. A couple dozen picoseconds or something like that in simulation time. So e even if you get like a structure, it's like, is, it, is that enough? I don't know. My guess is that, that 
it's a really hard problem, but like to get the protein folding pump right. But mm -hmm. even if you do it, I think you're right. There's still much more you need to get the dynamics, you need mm -hmm. the behavior. There are these things called ion channels where they have these um, exquisite electric fields going to you get the electric field right with your reinforcement learner. Mm -hmm. um, all these things. So actually the ion channels are important because cystic fibrosis is actually mm -hmm. I believe an ion channel disease where the ions, mm -hmm. the channels are not pumping. I would like to say potassium, but I might be messing that up. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are all these other layers on top that so again it's it's all coming back to you. It's a game where there is no win. You know, there's no win loss situation. There's this ever increasing levels of complexity. Yeah. yeah. And this is all coming back in that we have these very brittle AI systems that only learn, even now, 19 by 19 game points. Mm -hmm. And if we could ease the complexity, different game points, different rules, mm -hmm. we get closer to the full challenge of science. But science is still a grander challenge than anything AI has faced. That is exciting that you're probably seeing that they will try at least. This will be a high profile example of AI being used in the sciences. And I think this is really almost like in some ways the goal of DeepMind is that I think Dennis's thesis for the company was that you know in order to become a, a scientist that makes a difference in your field in chemistry, biology, or something like this, you know you're probably almost thirty years old at that point. Mm -hmm. You spent your entire life learning, you know. I'm, I'm getting close to that big three zero myself. Yeah, and you spent your entire life learning, and, and you know there's just maybe too much to know. Maybe it's too much for humans to know. Maybe we'll reach a point in the future where research is kind of just guided by machines, guided by humans and machines are actually doing the research. These things are beyond human imagination. So this is maybe why we need Elon Musk's Neuralink or whatever. So <laughs> we become the yeah. machine. Because otherwise, how else are we going to understand it? What do you What do you think about the Neuralink? So, I think again, it's an instance of somewhat IT people yeah. diving deep into this. We saw, okay, mm -hmm. Elon Musk has a track record of achieving. Yeah. So there's you know Tesla, there's SpaceX, but the thing is Tesla and SpaceX are engineering companies. Mm -hmm. They're not biology companies. And Neuralink is getting very deep into the messiness of the brain. Mm -hmm. So the one thing about the drug discovery industry, cancer is really hard. It takes decades to make a good cancer drug, and all, more often than not, you fail. Um, there's been a lot of breakthroughs in that space, but cancer is arguably nothing in complexity compared to the brain. Like. Mm -hmm infinitely more complex. We don't have the, the, even the faintest understanding of much of what's going on in there. Um, so, can you, can you imagine constructing that clinical trial? Oh god, I don't even know, man. Yeah, I don't know, you know, maybe you're using early for 10 years and then you start getting things. How do you... Oh, how do you control it? Oh, that's scary. Completely conceivable, yeah. That's, that's a so, so scary, right? Like, well, yeah, I mean, you're running electric currents to the brain. What if, you know... Who knows what that could do? What if there's like some bias in it? And we've seen all these things with you know the Russian uh, attackers making use of Facebook to <laughs> potentially yeah. uh, influence the election. What if someone hacked into Neuralink and then it's potentially it's like Big Brother, but you like it? Ooh. Yeah, it's it's a dangerous game. It is, a and, and I think game. it'll be it's a very long time out. Um, the good news is that you know Elon Musk he, he can fund this for quite some time. Which is a good thing. So, you know, if there's something there, it's probably the one that could achieve it. Also, I would wager you're going to see AGI before the brain is solved, even. I think that's a hard I agree. Problem. Yeah, I've actually thought this for some time, and I think people didn't take this too seriously. I think it's much easier to actually invent a brain than it is to actually figure out how ours works. Oh, God, yes. Um, it's like building a mechanical bird versus mm -hmm. a plane. There are no mechanical birds, there are plenty of planes. Yeah, yeah. And you know, there's this very famous neuroscience study. So the Jane Neuroscience is watching. It's probably the time to cut that video. But basically, you had the human neuroscientists, and they were given an Intel CPU, which mm -hmm. is, is this flat piece of silicon. It's two-dimensional. It has all sorts of, it's, I mean, it's quite sophisticated, but still nothing compared to the brain. Mm -hmm. And they said, hey, you know, you guys are neuroscientists. You guys are using all these tools to figure out how the brain works. Why don't you use those to tell me how the CPU works? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you know, they all these experiments. They kind of, you know, they ran current through certain parts of it, and they're like, oh, cool. Well, like you ran, you know, current through this part, and then it popped out the other side, and it was like ones and zeros, and like, um, you know, this turned this off, this turned that on, and they kind of, you know, they they, they put all their work together, and in the end, they basically learned almost nothing about how the CPU works. I um, remember this. They figured out like the clock cycle. Yeah. They didn't figure out like the arithmetic units or anything. Mm -hmm. 
I think this is like, I would like to say Eric Jonas and Conrad Cordy's paper. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, and they made almost no progress towards the CPU, and you know, the CPU quite complex, but nothing compared. I mean, the brain is vastly more complex. Infinitely. Even. So I just don't think we have the tools to study it. No, I think you know? not at all. And I think you're going to see the rise of small intelligent entities. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to be less and less limited as time goes on. But there's a different. This is why I don't necessarily take these fears of super intelligence too seriously, right? Mm -hmm. Because I don't even see a way for a super intelligent entity to solve one of these hard problems. That's it. I can see plenty of ways for malicious human actors to make use of tools like uh, mm -hmm. AlphaGo Zero, which is why DeepMind open source that. Um, mm -hmm. We need to study it in yeah. order to. What if you have a version of AlphaGo Zero that learns to hack? Not unreasonable. Not inconceivable. Yeah. Now that's scary. Oh, there's yeah, and there's like this game that hackers play. It's like capture the flag, right? Oh, yeah. You a server, I have a server. We try to hack each other, right? And I think there's even darker contests where they did like some primitive AI to to do capture the flag. I, I think uh, this new alpha goes zero is especially well suited for problems like that. You just have these two things that hack each other all day. So I think mm -hmm. really it's going to be, um, it's like, what's, it's like human wizards controlling mm -hmm. armies of golems to attack each other. That is perhaps the future. This, I don't think Starcraft. <laughs> if you solve yeah. Starcraft, so. One very scary thing that I think AI researchers intimately realize, but mm -hmm. uh, many people don't, is that drones are scary. And if you just take a little bit of C4, glue it to a drone, and fly it at something, it will blow up. Mm -hmm. Now imagine StarCraft is about controlling hundreds of agents mm -hmm. and getting them to perform flanking maneuvers. Awfully. And imagine you have mm -hmm. thousands of drones controlled by an alpha go zero Descendant mm -hmm. that is flying them autonomously. That is an unbeatable swarm that could probably defeat any aerial force in the world today. And it yeah. is extraordinarily scary. And I bet you that the Pentagon, and the Chinese, the Russians mm -hmm. are thinking about and planning for this right now. They're they probably have like entire force in there. Yeah, guys. it's you know the descendants of AlphaGo Zero. These are you know probably equivalent to the, the first nuclear bomb in some ways. Yes, uh, of their danger to the world. And I think that's absolutely right. Like this mm -hmm. isn't some sense of nuclear bomb moment. It's mm -hmm. not super intelligent. Like a super intelligent HEI is almost a deity. We don't need to go that far. Yeah. Nuclear bomb did not make us deities, but it changed the world. Mm -hmm. And I think we're beginning to see how an Alpha Gun Zero descendant could change the world. And and I think regulation has to catch up. I, I think there probably are things that, that you as an AI researcher can work on and can't work on. You know, if you build an AI and it fits a crime, whose fault is that? Oh, God. It's kind of unclear right now. And what if you build an AI that learns optimal AK-47 drone control? Should yeah. you be able to build that? Probably not. I think so, and I think it's time yeah. for regulation. Um, we've done, I think, a decent job of self-governance. There have been mm -hmm. no AI horror stories yet, mm -hmm. but I think it's better if we self-regulate and get this process going rather than uh, terrible tragedies to happen potentially. Or they're really, I think there's a number of groups trying to get a basically Geneva Convention around uh, banning use of autonomous weapons in warfare. It, it, mm -hmm. It's probably for the better of the world that you don't have these you know, Alpha Go Zero drone squads. Yeah, and I think this is what Elon Musk is kind of vouching for. He's kind of talking about you know, a lot of these things is that you know, the regulation has to catch up. And you know what's funny is that the AI community is actually pretty open to this. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I haven't met anyone in the AI community that's like, oh, like, don't regulate us. I, I think everyone who's on the bleeding edge of AI right now is actually a little bit concerned about where things could go. Yeah. And you know? I think my problem with the AGI crowd is, is that, yes, AGI is worrisome, but there are more dangerous things that can exist like literally one or two years out. Yeah. We should worry about those and get those regulated. And my guess is that the regulatory framework we get set up to help us solve these issues mm -hmm. will help us deal with the AGI problem. In fact, that might be the best way to actually get a handle, rather than solving theoretical math problems about AGI. Mm -hmm. Let's build real world regulatory and control systems so that when an AGI comes in, we'll have systems in place that if we have uh, audit, say auditing semi AIs or things that mm -hmm. provide, I don't even know how to structure this impact. How would you set up a regulation? I don't know. I think it's really hard. Yeah, which um, is why we should get started on today. 
In some ways, the, the problem is as from more to regulating quantitative finance. Oh. These high frequency hedge fund guys, like, how do you regulate that? Uh, it's really hard, you know. Um, because people just run around whatever you do. Yeah, I mean, what, what is your what if your reinforcement version like learns the wrong thing? Are you responsible for that? Like, yeah. Wasn't there, wasn't there this like um, IPX or something? So this is like an exchange where they put like a damper. So all trades took some amount of five seconds or whatever to pass. Oh, oh I've heard of that. Yes, yeah, so you don't have continuous. Well, you don't really have continuous time, but then you you definitely don't have continuous time. Yes. Um, Did that catch on? I don't think it caught on. I, from my understanding of high frequency trading, it's kind of unclear whether it's a good or a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing in that it probably tightens spreads, so you have less transaction costs for your trading. That's a good thing. Um, it's unclear if it causes volatility mm -hmm. or it's attracted to volatility. If you're a high frequency trader, you like movements so that you can make money. Yep. Um, so, you know, when you see high frequency trading activity coincide with volatility, is that causing it or is it correlated? We don't know. Um, I think the jury's out. On that so, one. what is an alpha goes zero high frequency trader? Is that is is there like are there seven hedge funds frantically working on this today? I'm sure they are. Absolutely. Um, in in high frequency trading too, I think you have enough signal where you actually could conceivably do a lot of these things. Um, you know, longer longer time horizons, I don't think you have enough signal to train on reinforcement learning agents. So, really, this gets to the long range understanding as humans. Yeah. We have a structure of how the world behaves, which lets us, like you, you read Plato or Socrates or mm -hmm. uh, whoever from 2,000 years ago, they understood enough about the structure of the world that it, whatever they say in some form still holds true today. We don't have anything in AI that does that, the type of yeah. structural understanding. Yeah, especially for long range patterns of the markets, like I don't even know there's much to learn. It's, is, it's, is there, I like, it's, it's almost a martingale. What is a martingale? Uh, a martingale basically assumes that you know the what you have at the next time step basically has no mutual information with anything you've observed in the past. So it's like a memoryless process, essentially. Uh, yeah, I think that's actually that. Is that true? Though, because like the rich stay rich and the poor usually stay poor, and that's the unfortunate fact of today's society. Is that? But that doesn't seem memoryless. So there must be some structure in the market. We are seeing inequality in. Things like that versus. I think you see inequality, but, but that's probably because people are in the markets rather than having their cash under their mattress. You know, I, I, the rich—I don't think rich people perform any better in the stock market than, you know, mm. than any other group would. Well, that's so, a good point. So um, you're saying that while the market is memoryless, the initial conditions mm -hmm. influence what's going to happen. Yeah, it's. Uh, you know, if you look at trading windows of like 10 years, people who like consistently beat the market by like a, a meaningfully risk adjusted basis, like a meaningful risk adjusted difference. Warren Buffett's. Um, very, very rare. You know, people who have a sharp over one or in 10 years, you're like 98% tolerant. What's a sharp? Uh, just your returns divided by your standard deviation of returns. Oh, I see. So how many yeah. standard deviations are, are you above? Which makes a lot of sense because, you know, if you make twice as much money, you make twice as much risk. Mm. Um, you can factor out the two. Well, you don't factor it out; just it goes to one, right? So, yep, 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 yep. Yeah. So, so the, the ratio stays the same. So, could there be an alpha go zero Warren Buffett? Is that how hard is that? Um, I don't give enough data. And that's a fair point. There is a simulator. Well, there is a simulator, but you'd have to play for decades. Yeah, there's just, there isn't enough good data. I think you have maybe like twenty years of good data on the financial markets. And also, you have like regimes in the data too. This is also a weird thing too. Like, what's out of sample? You know. What if you built like an AI economy and you just learn to learn in the AI economy, and you did this for thousands of economies of different board sizes, so to speak, that got bigger and bigger? Yeah. You, think you could learn. You could learn to learn the structure of the market. I probably can't release the answer to that. I, I, do, <laughs> I have run. I have, I have run some experiments in that area. I, uh, that's an interesting place to go. All right. Yeah. So, hedge fund watchers, you have your homework. <laughs> uh, if one of you doesn't make a trillion dollars, we'll be disappointed. Yeah. Can you make a, a vast simulated market and learn to learn there, run it for a hundred thousand years, and bring it into the, the present? Maybe, maybe you would learn something interesting. I bet you would. All right. Yeah. And with that, thank you for listening. I think we had a great conversation, talked about a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. Hope you learned a little bit about AI and. Hopefully join us uh, the next time we do one of these. All right. All right. Good night. Till next time.